Okay, chapter 12. The Polyjuice Potion. I'm like awaiting for the alert so that. Oh, Brilliant. There we go. Brilliant. That was really loud. Was that really loud for you guys too? I mean, I can't complain. You are in Ravenclaw because you are brilliant. Welcome to the fantasy. Chapter 12, The Polyjuice Potion. They stepped off the stone staircase at the top and Professor McGonagall rapped on the door. It opened silently and they entered. Professor McGonagall told Harry to wait and left him there alone. Oh, yes, now I remember. So the very last like sentence was Harry is actually going to see Professor Dumbledore in his office. This is the first time Harry has ever gone to Dumbledore's office and it's kind of like in a secret area. And it's kind of scary because he might be in trouble because he seems to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and might be responsible for opening the Chamber of Secrets maybe. We don't know. So that's what we're doing. That's what we're trying to figure out here. So he's going to see Dumbledore. So he, it's kind of nerve-wracking. It's like going to the principal's office. Literally, going to the headmaster's office. Harry looked around. One thing was certain. Of all the teacher's offices Harry had visited so far this year, Dumbledore's was by far the most interesting. If he hadn't been scared out of his wits that he was about to be thrown out of school, he would have been very pleased to have a chance to look around it. It was a very large and beautiful circular room, full of funny little noises. A number of curious silver instruments stood on spindle-legged tables, whirring and emitting little puffs of smoke. The walls were covered with portraits of old headmasters and headmistresses, all of whom were snoozing gently in the frames. There was also an enormous claw-footed desk, and sitting on a shelf behind it, a shabby tattered wit wizard's hat the sorting hat. Harry hesitated. Let me show you the picture that we have here. I like your name too. Yes. He cast a wary eye around the sleeping witches and wizards on the walls. Surely it couldn't hurt if he took the hat down and tried it on again. Just to see. Just to make sure it had put him in the right house. He walked quietly around the desk, lifted the hat from its shelf, and lowered it slowly onto his head. It was much too large and slipped down over his eyes. Just as it had done the last time he'd put it on, Harry stared at the black inside of the hat, waiting. Then a small voice said in his ear, Be in your bonnet, Harry Potter? Uh, Yes, Harry muttered. Uh, sorry to bother you. I wanted to ask. You've been wondering whether I put you in the right house, said the hat smartly. Yes, you were particularly difficult to place. But I stand by what I said before. Harry's heart leapt. You would have done well in Slytherin. Harry's stomach plummeted. He grabbed the point of the hat and pulled it off. It hung limply in his hand, grubby and faded. Harry pushed it back on the shelf, feeling sick. You're wrong, he said aloud to the still and silent hat. It didn't move. Harry backed away, watching it. Then a strange gagging noise behind him made him wheel around. Early I was joking with a friend about doing Harry Potter psychoanalyst, but I just wanted to take a second here to talk about the struggle Harry's going through because I think it relates to a lot of us. I, I guess all of us really. Sometimes we have this voice inside of us that's feeling like doubting ourselves and doubting the choices we make and wondering like am I bad? Am I good? And kind of doubting whether or not we really are who we want to be and hope to be 
and there's almost this fear, and Harry's feeling that now he has this fear that maybe he should have been in Slytherin, and we know there's nothing wrong in Slytherin, as we will learn as we go through the books, but especially in these early books, there's definitely a bad connotation for Slytherin, and Slytherin is like the evil ones, the enemies, at least in the, f in the first books, so he doesn't want to be in Slytherin, he, that's considered him that's like being an, a villain and so he has this voice inside of him that's questioning am I a villain maybe I am everyone else thinks I am and when you go through life everyone else is sometimes going to think certain things about you that you don't want to be true but when Harry puts on the hat and the hat is telling him what house he should be in but at the same time it really comes down to his choice and he chose Gryffindor he chose to be brave and to be good he could have chose bad. And so in this case, Harry is almost like a foil to Voldemort, the true villain, because Voldemort also could have been a great, wonderful wizard. He did amazing things, but instead he decided to choose bad, and it was that choice that makes the difference. And so J.K. Rowling is expertly showing us here that it's all your choice who you want to be. Yes, we all wish there was a magical hat we could place on our heads that would read our soul and tell us who we're supposed to be, but when it comes to being good or being bad, making the right choice or the wrong choice, being who you know you're supposed to be or who the bad sides of you and people around you tell you you should be, it's all your choice. And that's what I like. This book is trying to teach us something about life right there. Okay. Oh, there's another picture. Interesting. We're going to find out what that's all about in a moment. He wasn't alone after all. Standing on a golden perch behind the door was a decrepit-looking bird which resembled a half-plucked turkey. Harry stared at it and the bird looked balefully back, making its gagging noise again. <laughs> Harry thought it looked very ill. Its eyes were dull. And even as Harry watched, a couple more feathers fell out of its tail. Harry was just thinking that all he needed was for Dumbledore's pet bird to die while he was alone in the office with it. When the bird burst into flames, Harry yelled in shock and backed away into the desk. He looked feverishly around in case there was a glass of water somewhere, but he couldn't see one. Oh man, I could have hidden this from him. The bird, meanwhile, had become a fireball. It gave one loud shriek, and next second, there was nothing but a smoldering pile of ash on the floor. <coughs> the office door opened. Dumbledore came in, looking very somber. P Professor! Harry gasped. Your, your bird! I couldn't do anything! He just caught fire! To Harry's astonishment, Dumbledore smiled. <sighs> about time to, he said. He's been looking dreadful for days. I've been telling him to get a move on. He chuckled at the stunned look on Harry's face. Fox is a phoenix, Harry. Phoenixes burst into flame when it is time for them to die and are reborn from the ashes. Watch him. Harry looked down in time to see a tiny, wrinkled, newborn bird poke its head out of the ashes. It was quite as ugly as the old one. It's a shame you had to see him on a burning day, said Dumbledore, seating himself behind his desk. He's really very handsome most of the time. Wonderful red and gold plumage. Fascinating creatures, phoenixes. They can carry immensely heavy loads. Their tears have healing powers, and they make highly faithful pets. In the shock of Fox catching fire, Harry had forgotten what he was there for. But it all come back to him as Dumbledore settled himself into the high-backed chair behind the desk and fixed Harry with his penetrating light blue stare. And here's the picture of the little bird.
right. I'll wait outside then, headmaster. And he stomped out, looking embarrassed. You don't think it was me, Professor? Harry repeated hopefully as Dumbledore brushed rooster feathers off his desk. No, Harry, I don't, said Dumbledore, though his face was somber again. But I still want to talk to you. Harry waited nervously while Dumbledore considered him, the tips of his long fingers together. I must ask you, Harry, whether there is anything you'd like to tell me, he said gently. Anything at all. Harry didn't know what to say. He thought of Malfoy shouting, You'll be next, mudbloods! And the polyjuice potion simmering away in Moni Myrtle's bathroom. Then he thought of the disembodied voice he had heard twice and remembered what Ron had said. Hearing voices no one else can hear isn't a good sign, even, even in the wizarding world. He thought, too, about what everyone else was saying about him and his growing dread that he was somehow connected with Salazar Slytherin. No, said Harry, there isn't anything, Professor. The double attack on Justin and Nearly Headless Nick turned what had hitherto been nervousness into real panic. Curiously, it was Nearly Headless Nick's fate that seemed to worry people most. What could possibly do that to a ghost? People asked each other. What terrible power could harm someone who was already dead? There was almost a stampede to book seats on the Hogwarts Express so that students could go home for Christmas. Hmm, so are we, I guess we left Dumbledore's. That was the end. That was all he said to Dumbledore. Such a shame that at this time Dumbledore doesn't reach out to Harry in a more prodding way and get him to open up. Because, you know, from Harry's perspective, he doesn't want to get in trouble or get kicked out of school. If he only knew... He only knew how much faith Dumbledore has in him, and that Dumbledore really can open up, th or that Harry really can open up to Dumbledore and trust him. But so much in lives, in our lives, we are afraid to open up to people in the moments, and they're afraid to really say what they need to say to get us to open up to them as well. And we don't really know what to say to each other, but we want so bad to connect only we could really connect all the time. All right. At this rate, we'll be the only ones left, Ron told Hermione and Harry. Us, Malfoy, Crab and Goyle. What a jolly holiday it's going to be. Crab and Goyle, who always did whatever Malfoy did, had signed up to stay over the holidays too. But Harry was glad that most people were leaving. He was tired of people skirting around him in the corridors as though he was about to sprout fangs or spit poison. Tired of all the muttering, pointing, and hissing as he passed. Fred and George, however, found all this very funny. Of course they did. <laughs> they went out of their way to march ahead of Harry down the corridor, shouting, Make way for the heir of Slytherin! Seriously, evil wizard coming through! <laughs> Oh, they're funny. What happened to our music? I just noticed it stopped. <laughs> Let's bring it back. Bring back music. Okay. It's back. Where were we? Percy was deeply disapproving of Fred and George's behaviour. It's not a laughing matter, he said coldly. Oh, get out of the way, Percy, said Fred. Harry's in a hurry. <laughs> yeah, he's nipping off to the Chamber of Secrets for a cup of tea with his fang servant, said George, chorting. Guinea didn't find it amusing either. Oh, don't, she wailed every time Fred and asked Harry loudly who was planning to attack next, or George pretended to ward Harry off with a large clove of garlic when they met. Harry didn't mind. It made him feel better that Fred and George, at least, thought the idea of him being Slytherin's heir was quite ludicrous. But their antics seemed to be aggravating Draco Malfoy, who looked increasingly sour each time he saw them at it. It's 
Because he's bursting to say it's really him, said Ron knowingly. You know how he hates anyone beating him at anything, and you're getting all the credit for his dirty work. Not for long, said Hermione in a satisfied tone. The polyjuice potion's nearly ready. We'll be getting the truth out of him any day now. At last, term ended, and a silence deep as snow on the grounds descended on the castle. Harry found it peaceful rather than gloomy, and enjoyed the fact that he, Hermione, and the Weasleys had run of had the run of Gryffindor Tower, which meant they could play Exploding Snap loudly without bothering anyone, and practice dueling in private. Fred, George, and Ginny had chosen to stay at school rather than visit Bill in Egypt with Mr. and Mrs. Weasley. Percy, who disapproved of what he termed their childish behavior, didn't spend much time in the Gryffindor common room. He had already told them pompously that he was only staying over Christmas because it was his duty as prefect to support the teachers during this troubled time. Christmas morning dawned, cold and white. Harry and Ron, the only ones left in the dormitory, were woken very early by Hermione, who burst in, fully dressed and carrying presents for them both. Wake up, she said loudly, pulling back the curtains at the window. Hermione, you're not supposed to be in here, said Ron, shielding his eyes against the light. Merry Christmas to you too, said Hermione, throwing him his present. I've been up for nearly an hour, adding more lace wings to the potion. It's ready. Harry sat up suddenly, wide awake. Are you sure? Positive, said Hermione, shifting Scab as the rat so that she could sit down on the end of the spore poster. If we're going to do it, I say it should be tonight. At that moment, Hedwig swooped at the room, carrying a very small package in her beak. Hello, said Harry happily as she landed on his bed. Are you speaking to me again? Oh, because she was mad after they crashed the car into the wop Whomping Willow, <laughs> and her cage flew everywhere. She nibbled his ear in an affectionate sort of way, which was a far better present than the one she had brought him which turned out to be from the Dursleys. They had sent Harry a toothpick and a note telling him to find out whether he'd be able to stay at Hogwarts for the summer holidays, too. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's awesome, though, for Harry. If he could stay at Hogwarts all summer, he'd love that. Maybe he could take advantage of that note and stay with Ron for the summer. The rest of Harry's Christmas presents were far more satisfactory. Hagrid had sent him a large tin of treacle fudge, which Harry decided to soften by the fire before eating. Mmm, I love fudge. Ron had given him a book called Flying with the Cannons, a book of interesting facts about his favorite Quidditch team, and Hermione had bought him a luxury eagle feather quill. Harry opened the last present to find a new hand-knitted jumper from Mrs. Weasley. Really quick, did you notice that both his friends bought bought Harry gifts that they would like. That's really funny. That's kind of how most people give gifts, is you give your friend something that you would like. Which is fine, because you're still giving a gift and that's nice, but I challenge you guys to think when you give someone a gift, try to think beyond what just you would like into what they would like. Yeah, it's a tip. <laughs> Harry Potter and tips. I'm here all week, people. All right. Harry opens the last present to find a new hand-knitted jumper from Mrs. Weasley and a large plum cake. I don't know what a plum cake is, but it sounds nice. He put up her card with a fresh surge of guilt, thinking about Mr. Weasley's car, which hadn't been seen since its crash with the Whomping Willow. Oh yeah, that was a bad idea. And the bout of rule breaking he and Ron were planning next. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> you <laughs> Abby's laughing. I will give my friends something that I will hate. <laughs> hey, if it's something you hate and something they love, that's even a better gift. Like for my birthday, my husband gave me taking me to the mall because he hates the mall and he never goes with me and I love the mall. Actually, it's okay. It's kind of okay, I'm realizing. I used to love it, but now it's just okay. But it's still, I never get to go with him. So it was a good gift, because he hates it, and I love it. So 
look at. Anyway. No one, not even someone dreading taking Polyjuice Potion later, could fail to enjoy Christmas dinner at Hogwarts. I want to have Christmas dinner at Hogwarts. The Great Hall looked magnificent. Not only were there a dozen frost-covered Christmas trees and thick streamers of holly and mistletoe crisscrossing the ceiling, but enchanted snow was falling, warm and dry, from the ceiling. Aww. Dumbledore led them in a few of his favorite carols. Ooh, I wonder what a wizard carol is. It's Christmas at Hogwarts. We are singing and playing with the owls and a wand. And we're dancing on the tables and eating magic stuff. <laughs> it's my Christmas carol. <laughs> Hope you like it. Copyright, Kerensky 23. Hagrid booming more and more loudly with every goblet of eggnog he consumed. Percy, who hadn't noticed that Fred had bewitched his prefect badge, so it now read Pinhead, <laughs> kept asking them all why they were sniggering at it. Harry didn't even care that Draco Malfoy was making loud, snide remarks about his new jumper from Slytherin Table. With a bit of luck, Malfoy would be getting his comeuppance in a few hours' time. Harry and Ron had barely finished their third helpings of Christmas pudding when Hermione ushered them out of the hall to finalize their plans for the evening. We still need a bit of the people you're changing into, said Hermione matter-of-factly, as though she was sending them to the supermarket for washing powder. And, obviously, it'll be best if you can get something of Crab and Goyle's they're Malfoy's best friends. He'll tell them anything. And we also need to make sure the real Crab and Goyle can't burst in on us while we're interrogating him. I've got it all worked out, she went on smoothly, ignoring Harry and Ron's stup stupefied faces. She held up two plump chocolate cakes. I filled these with simple sleeping drought. All you have to do is make sure Crab and Goyle find them. You know how greedy they are. They're bound to eat them. Once they're asleep, pull out a few of the hairs and hide them in a broom cupboard. Harry and Ron looked incredulously at each other. Hermione, I don't think that could go seriously wrong. But Hermione had a steely glint in her eye, not unlike the one Professor McGonagall sometimes had. The potion will be useless without Crab and Goyle's hair. She said sternly, You do want to investigate Malfoy, don't you? Oh, all right, all right, said Harry. But what about you? Whose hair are you ripping out? I've already got mine, said Hermione brightly, pulling out a tiny bottle out of her pocket and showing them a single hair inside. Remember Millicent Bolstrode wrestling with me at the dueling club? She left this on my robes when she was trying to strangle me. And she's gone home for Christmas, so I'll just have to tell the Slytherins I've decided to come back. When Hermione had bustled off to check on the Polyjuice Potion again, Ron turned to Harry with a doom-laden expression. <laughs> Hello, Champion Tofu. Welcome. Have you ever heard of a plan where so many things can go wrong? But to Harry and Ron's utter amazement, stage one of the operation went just as smoothly as Hermione had said. They lurked in the deserted entrance hall after Christmas tea, waiting for Crab and Goyle, who had remained alone at the Slytherin table. Shoveling down fourth helpings of trifle, Harry had perched the chocolate cakes on the end of the banisters. When they spotted Crab and Goyle coming out of the Great Hall, Harry and Ron hid quickly behind a suit of armor next to the front door. How thick can you get? Ron whispered ecstatically as Crab gleefully pointed out the cakes to Goyle and cr grabbed them. Grinning stupidly, they stuffed the cakes whole into their large mouths. For a moment, both of them chewed greedily, looks of triumph on their faces. Then, without the smallest change of expression, they both keeled over backwards onto the floor. Much of the most difficult bit was hiding them in a cupboard across the hall. Once they were safely stowed against the buckets and mops, Harry yanked out a couple of the bristles that covered Goyle's forehead and Ron pulled out several of Crab's hairs. They also stole their shoes because their own were far too small for Crab and Goyle-sized feet. That's smart. There's the picture. A 
have us some mentioning of Christmas tea, make me want to have some of my own. Hmm. Lovely. Then, still stunned at what they had just done, they sprinted up to Moni Myrtle's bathroom. They could hardly see for the thick black smoke issuing from the cubicle in which Hermione was stirring the cauldron. Pulling the robes up over the faces, Harry and Ron knocked softly on the door. Hermione? They heard the scrape of the lock and Hermione emerged, shiny-faced and looking anxious. Behind her, they heard the gloop, gloop of the bubbling, treacle-thick potion. Three glass tumblers stood ready on the toilet seat. It's a gross place to put your glasses. Did you get them? Hermione asked breathlessly. Harry showed her goyle's hair. Good, and I sneaked these spare robes out of the laundry. Hermione said, holding up a small sack. You'll need bigger sizes once you're crab and goyle. The three of them stared into the cauldron. Close up, the potion looked like thick, dark mud bubbling sluggishly. I'm sure I've done everything right, said Hermione, nervously rereading the slotch page of most potent potions. It looks like the book says it should, once we've drunk it, we'll have exactly an hour before we change back into ourselves. Now what? Ron whispered. We separate it into the three glasses and add the hairs. Hermione ladled large dollops of the potion into each of the glasses. Then, her hand trembling, she shook Millicent Bulstrode's hair out of its bottle into the first glass. The potion hissed loudly like a boiling kettle and frothed madly. A second later, it had turned a sick sort of yellow. Ugh, essence of Millicent Bulstrode, said Ron, eyeing it with loathing. That it tastes disgusting. Add yours, then, said Hermione. Harry dropped Goyle's hair into the middle glass, and Ron put crabs into the last one. Both glasses hissed and frothed. Goyle's turned the khaki color of a bogey. Crab's dark, murky brown. <laughs> what? Is that true? <laughs> no, I probably won't. I'm just drinking my Christmas tea. It's actually lavender, not Christmas flavor. Oh well. Hang on, said Harry, as Ron and Hermione reached for the glasses. We'd better not all drink them in here. Once we turn into Crab and Goyle, we won't fit. And Millicent Bolstrode's no pixie. Good thinking, said Ron, unlocking the door. We'll take separate cubicles. Careful not to spill a drop of the polyjuice potion. Harry slipped into the middle cubicle. Ready, he called. Ready, came Ron and Hermione's voices. One, two, three. Pinching his nose, Harry drank the potion down in two large gulps. It tasted like overcooked cabbage. Immediately, his insides started writhing as though he just swallowed live snakes. Doubled up, he wondered whether he was going to be sick. Then a burning sensation spread rapidly from his stomach to the very ends of his fingers and toes. Next, bringing him gasping to all fours, came a horrible, melting feeling as the skin all over his body bubbled like hot wax. And before his eyes, his hands began to grow the fingers thickened, the nails broadened, and the knuckles were bulging like bolts. His shoulders stretched painfully, and a prickling on his forehead told him that hair was creeping down towards his eyebrows. His robes ripped as his chest expanded like a barrel bursting its hoops. His feet were agony in shoes four sizes too small. You thought about going to the cubicle, but you didn't think about getting naked first, Harry? Come on. It's obvious you should have taken your clothes off instead of ripping out of them like the Hulk. Harry the Hulk. As suddenly as it had started, everything stopped. 
Harry lay face down on the cold stone floor, listening to Myrtle gurgling morosely in the end toilet. With difficulty, he kicked off his shoes and stood up. So this is what it felt like to be... Goyle. His large hands trembling, he pulled off his old robes, which were hanging a foot above his ankles, pulled on the spare ones, and laced up Goyle's boat-like shoes. He reached up to brush his hair out of his eyes and met only the short growth of wiry bristles low on his forehead. Then he realized that his glasses were clouding his eyes, because... Goyle obviously didn't need them. He took them off and called, Are you two okay? Goyle's low rasp of a voice issued from his mouth. Oh, sorry. Are you two okay? <laughs> Thank you, fire guy. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Came the deep grunt of crab from his right. <laughs> Harry unlocked his door and stepped in front of a cracked mirror. Goyle stared back at him out of his dull, deep-set eyes. Harry scratched his ear. So did Goyle. Ron's door opened. They stared at each other, except that he looked pale and shocked. Ron was indistinguishable from Crab. From the pudding basin haircut to the long gorilla arms. This is unbelievable, said Ron, approaching the mirror and prodding Crab's flat nose. Unbelievable. We'd better get... Oh, <clears throat> we better get going, said Harry, loosening the watch, which was cutting into Goyle's thick wrist. We've still got to find out where the Slytherin common room is. I only hope we can find someone to follow. Ron, who'd been gazing at Harry, said, You don't know how bizarre it is to see Goyle thinking. <laughs> he banged on Hermione's door. Come on, we need to go. A high-pitched voice answered him. I don't think I'm coming. After all, you go on without me. Hermione, we know Millicent Bolstrode's ugly. No one's going to know it's you. No, really, I don't think I can come. You two hurry up. You're wasting time. Harry looked at Ron, bewildered. That looks more like Goyle, said Ron. That's how he looks every time a teacher asks him a question. Looks like that. <laughs> Hermione! Oh wait, this is Goyle now. Gotta get my voices correct. There's like too many people and too many bodies. Hermione, are you okay? Said Harry through the door. Fine! I'm fine! Go on! Harry looked at his watch. Five of the precious 60 minutes had already passed. We'll meet you back here, all right, he said. Harry and Ron opened the door of the bathroom carefully, checked that the coast was clear, and set off. Don't swing your arms like that, Harry muttered to Ron. Hey? Crab holds some sort of stick. How's this? Yeah, that's better. <laughs> they went down the marble staircase. All they needed now was a Slytherin, whom they could follow to the Slytherin common room. But there was nobody around. Any ideas? muttered Harry. The Slytherins always come to break from there, said Ron, nodding at the entrance to the dungeons. Dun dungeons? The dungeons? The dungeons? <laughs> the words had barely left his mouth when a girl with long, curly hair emerged from the entrance. Excuse me, said Ron, hurrying up to her. We've forgotten the way to our common room. I beg your pardon, said the girl stiffly. A common room. I'm a Ravenclaw. She walked away, looking suspiciously back at them. Harry and Ron hurried down the stone steps into the darkness. Their footsteps echoing. Oh, I, maybe she was saying that. Ah, common room. I'm a Ravenclaw. Perhaps that, perhaps that's what was happening. I think that's probably what was happening. She walked away, looking suspiciously back at them. Harry and Ron hurried down the stone steps into the darkness, their footsteps echoing particularly loudly as Crab and Goyle's huge feet hit the floor, feeling that this wasn't going to be as easy as they hoped. The labyrinth passages were deserted. They walked deeper and deeper under the school, constantly checking their watches to see how much time they had left. After a quarter of an hour, just when they were getting desperate, they heard a sudden movement ahead. 
Wow, they spent a quarter of an hour just looking for the common room? That's... I don't remember that from the movies. <laughs> huh! Said Ron excitedly. There's one of them now! The figure was emerging from a side room. As they hurried nearer, however, their hearts sank. It wasn't a Slytherin. It was Percy. What are you doing down here? Said Ron in surprise. Percy looked affronted. That, he said stiffly, is none of your business. It's Crab, isn't it? Well, get off to your dormitories, said Percy sternly. It's not safe to go wandering around the dark corridors these days. You are, Ron pointed out. I, said Percy, drawing himself up, am a prefect. Nothing's about to attack me. A voice suddenly echoed behind Harry and Ron. Draco Malfoy was strolling towards them, and for the first time in his life, Harry was pleased to see him. <laughs> there you are, he drawled, looking at them. Have you two been pigging out in the Great Hall all this time? I've been looking for you. I want to show you something really funny. Malfoy glanced witheringly at Percy. What are you doing here, Weasley? He sneered. Percy looked outraged. You want to show me a bit more respect to your school prefect, he said. I don't like your attitude. Malfoy sneered and motioned Harry and Ron to follow him. Harry almost said something apologetic to Percy, but caught himself just in time. He and Ron hurried after Malfoy, who said as they turned into the next passage, That Peter Weasley... Percy, Ron corrected him automatically. Whatever, said Malfoy. I've noticed him sneaking around a lot lately, and I bet I know what he's up to. He thinks he's going to catch Slytherin's air single-handed. He gave a sort of derisive laugh. Harry and Ron exchanged excited looks. Malfoy paused by a stretch of bare, damp stone wall. What's the new password again? He said to Harry. Uh, uh, said Harry. <laughs> oh, yeah. Pure blood, said Malfoy. Not listening, and a stone door concealed in the wall slid open. Malfoy marched through it, and Harry and Ron followed him. The Slytherin common room was a long, low underground room with a rough stone wall and ceiling, from which round greenish lamps were hanging on chains. A fire was crackling under an elaborately carved mantelpiece ahead of them, and several sibl <laughs> several Slytherins, <laughs> Slytherins, were silhouetted around it in carved chairs. Wait here," said Malfoy to Harry and Ron, motioning them to a pair of empty chairs set back in the fire. "I'll go and get it. My father's just sent it to me." Wondering what Malfoy was going to show them, Harry and Ron sat down, doing their best to look at home. Malfoy came back a minute later, holding what looked like a newspaper cutting. He thrust it under Ron's nose. That'll give you a laugh, he said. Harry saw Ron's eyes widen in shock. He read the cutting quickly, gave a very forced laugh, <laughs> and handed it to Harry. It had been clipped out of the Daily Prophet, and it said, Inquiry at the Ministry of Magic. Arthur Weasley, head of the Misuse of Muggle Artifacts Office, was today fined 50 galleons for bewitching a muggle car. Oh, no! Mr. Lucius Malfoy, a governor of Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, where the enchanted car crashed earlier this year, called today for Mr. Wiz Weasley's resignation. Oh, Ron, try to stay calm. Stay calm, boo. Stay calm. Weasley had brought the ministry into disrepute, Mr. Malfoy told a reporter. He's clearly unfit to draw up our laws, and his ridiculous Muggle Protection Act should be scraped immediately or scrapped immediately. Mr. Weasley was unavailable for comment, although his wife told reporters to clear off or she'd set the family ghoul on them. Sounds like Mrs. Weasley. <laughs> Reported to the EU for copyright. <laughs> yes, because it's copyright to read books. <laughs> or do you mean my hat? 
Am I copying all the witches? Oh my goodness. You're right. This hat is so convenient. Can we copy strike PewDiePie? I'm gonna copy strike him. <laughs> oh, Automod. What's your favorite kind of pizza? Oh my gosh, so many pizzas. I like margarita pizza, but it doesn't have any meat on it, which is sad. So I guess after that, I like prosciutto and arugula pizza. Yeah, just good stuff. Well, said Malfoy impatiently as Harry handed him the, cut the cutting back to him. Don't you think it's funny? Ha, 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 said Harry bleakly. Arthur Weasley loves muggles so much. He should snap his wand in half and go join them, said Malfoy scornfully. You'd never know the Weasleys were purebloods the way they behave. Ron's, or rather, Crab's face was contorted with fury. This is my face of fury. What's up with you, Crab? snapped Malfoy. <laughs> Stomach ache, Ron grunted. Well, go up to the hospital wing and give all those mudbloods a kick from me, said Malfoy, snickering. You know, I'm surprised the Daily Prophet hasn't reported all these attacks yet, he went on thoughtfully. I suppose Dumbledore's trying to hush it all up. He'll be sacked if it doesn't stop soon. Father's always said Dumbledore's the worst thing that's ever happened to this place. He loves Muggleborns. A decent headmaster would never have let slime like that creepy in. Malfoy started taking pictures with an imaginary camera and did a cruel but accurate impression of Colin. Potter, can I have your picture? Potter, can I have your autograph? Can I lick your shoes, please? Potter! He dropped his hands and looked at Harry and Ron. What's the matter with you two? Far too late, Harry and Ron forced themselves to laugh. <laughs> but Malfoy seemed satisfied. Perhaps Crab and Goyle were always slow on the uptake. Saint Potter, the mudblood's friend, said Malfoy slowly. He's another one with no proper wizard feeling, or he wouldn't go around with that jumped up Granger mudblood. And people think he's Slytherin's heir. Harry and Ron waited with bated breath. Malfoy was surely seconds away from telling them it was him. But then, oh, I wish it, I knew who it was, said Malfoy petulantly. I could help them. Well, I guess it's not him, but he's still kind of a jerk. He wants to help them. I agree, Metlocks. We need to copy strike PewDiePie. Ron's jaw dropped so that Crab's face looked even more gormless than usual. Fortunately, Malfoy didn't notice. Let's see the picture of Malfoy. Doesn't he look so pleasant? Don't you just want him to be your best friend? <laughs> Harry, thinking fast, said, y You must have some idea who's behind it all. You know I haven't, Goyle. How many times do I have to tell you? Snapped Malfoy. And Father won't tell me anything about the last time the chamber opened either. Of course, it was 50 years ago, so it was before his time, but he knows all about it. And he says that it was all kept quiet and it'll look suspicious if I know too much about it. But I know one thing. The last time the Chamber of Secrets was opened, a mudblood died. So I bet it's only a matter of time before one of them is killed. I hope it's Granger, he said with relish. Ron was clenching Crab's gigantic fist feeling that it would be a bit of a giveaway if Ron punched Malfoy, Harry shot him a warning look and said, <clears throat> Do you know if the person who opened the chamber last time was caught? Oh yeah, whoever it was was expelled, said Malfoy. They're probably still in Azkaban. Azkaban? said Harry puzzled. Azkaban, the wizard prison. Goyle, said Malfoy, looking at him in disbelief. 
Honestly, if you were any slower, you'd be going backwards. That's actually a good one, Malfoy. Good job. He shifted restlessly in his chair and said, Father says to keep my head down and let the air slither and get on with it. He says the school still needs ridding of all the mudblood filth. But not to get mixed up in it. Of course, he's got a lot on his plate at the moment. You know the Ministry of Magic raided our manor last week. Harry tried to force Goyle's dull face into a look of concern. Yeah, said Malfoy. Luckily, they didn't find much. Father's got some very valuable dark art stuff, but luckily we've got our own secret chamber under the drawing room floor. Ho! Oh, said Ron. Malfoy looked at him. So did Harry. Ron blushed. Even his hair was turning red. His nose was also slowly lengthening. The hour was up. Ron was turning back into himself, and from the look of horror he was suddenly giving Harry, he must be too... They both jumped to their feet. <clears throat> Madison for my stomach, Ron grunted, and without further ado, they sprinted the length of the slithering, slithering common room, hurled themselves at the stone wall, and dashed up the passage, hoping against hope that Malfoy hadn't noticed anything. Harry could feel his feet slipping around in Goyle's huge shoes and had to hoist up his robes as he shrank. They crashed up the steps into the dark entrance hall, which was full of a muffled pounding coming from the cupboard where they locked Crab and Goyle. Leaving their shoes outside the cupboard, they sprinted in their socks up the marble staircase towards Moni Mental's bathroom. <sighs> well, it wasn't a complete waste of time, Ron panted, closing the bathroom door behind them. I know we still haven't found out who's doing the attacks, but I'm going to write to Dad tomorrow and tell him to check under Malfoy's drawing room. Harry checked his face in the cracked mirror. He was back to normal. He put his glasses on as Ron hammered on the door of Hermione's cubicle. Hermione, come out! We've got loads to tell you! Go away! Hermione squeaked. Harry and Ron looked at each other. What's the matter? said Ron. You must be back to normal by now. We are. But Morning Myrtle glided suddenly through the cubicle door. Harry had never seen her looking so happy. Ooh! <laughs> Wait till you see! She said, it's awful. They heard the lock slide back and Hermione emerge, sobbing, her robes pulled up over her head. What's up? said Ron uncertainly. Have you still got Millicent's nose or something? Hermione let her robes fall and Ron backed into the sink. Her face was covered in black fur. Her eyes had gone all yellow and there were long pointed ears poking through her hair. Ugh. It was c cat hair, she howled. M Millicent Bolstrode must have a cat. And the p potion isn't supposed to be used for animal transformations. Uh-oh, said Ron. You'll be teased something dreadful, said Myrtle happily. It's okay, Hermione, said Harry quickly. We'll take you up to the hospital wing. Madam Pomfrey never asked too many questions. It's a good quality in your teacher. I approve. It took a long time to persuade Hermione to leave the bathroom. Moni Myrtle sped them on their way with a hearty guffaw. Wait till everyone finds out you've got a tail! Hmm. That Moni Myrtle. Okay. Well, that is the end of a very great chapter, so very important chapter. We've discovered that Malfoy is not the heir of Slytherin, and it's also not Malfoy's father, which was, that was our whole guess, was that it was Malfoy's father who did it originally, and then Malfoy was doing it now. But it does seem like Malfoy's dad knows a little bit about it more than he's letting on to Malfoy. And his dad has some dark art kind of stuff in his house. So that's, uh, that's not good. And also, Arthur Weasley got in trouble for Harry and Ron's mistake, so that's that's a, that's a shame. But yeah, now we're kind of at square one. However, there's two clues that Malfoy gave us that are going to help us find a little bit more. Okay, so he told us that it's not his dad, so that's, you know, process of elimination. And it's not him, process of elimination. 
and it's uh, not hairy. We know that. And a muggle born died last time. A muggle born died last time it happened. <laughs> yes. Happy Clappy Time. It's a great plot twist. Um, a Muggleborn died, and what was the other thing he said? Oh, and he also said whoever did it is probably still in Azkaban. So, all we have to do is look at the list of people who are in prison and uh, find out who died around that time. And find out who went to prison around that time. And that will get us closer. At least that's what I would do. Alright, so next time we'll be reading Chapter 13, The Very Secret Diary. And I'm very curious to know what that guy has to do with anything. He looks like Mr. T, if he was also Cupid. So, very curious about that. And wow, look at the time, it's already 9.52. My goodness. 